Welcome back to Hollywood Interviews. We're here with producer, writer, director, Brian Volkweiss. Not a writer. Not a writer. You're not a writer? Never wrote anything. Don't you write his own name? I wrote one thing once. Okay, so what you're I guess I'm a writer, but I'm not a writer. Well, you're going to need to uh, let whoever does your IMDb change that. (laughs) Here's the problem with that IMDb. Nobody does nothing. (laughs) They, They do what they want. They do what they want. Well, someone wrote you down for a writing credit. All right, let's uh, let's jump into this. Usually we just go back and forth and ask questions, but he's got an awesome story. Let's jump into it. What's going on? Oh, you're talking about why I'm dressed like this? Why are you dressed in a suit? Yes. I'm very self-conscious of this. This That's why I got to tell this story, because I I hate suits. Um, I, about 2006, not to brag, I did produce the Oscar Tony Grammy, Emmy winning film. I am an EGOT uh, employee of the month, the uh, Jessica Simpson film. And I had to go to the premiere and I went with a very wealthy, successful woman. She forced me to go to a very fancy store in uh, Beverly Hills. And I found myself buying a suit for $3,000. And in case you think I'm an asshole, for bragging about a $3,000 suit. I'll tell you why, at least in my mind, I'm not. Not only is that the last suit I ever bought, so what is three grand over 18 years or whatever amortized into? Not a lot, I don't think. Um, But also, I intend to never buy another suit. So so there, that's why I'm dressed like this, because God, you know, I'm going to take this tie off. Is that all right? Take it off, you don't need it. Take it, take it off. Uh, I'm being told we now have to change this to an N17 rating. Uh, no. <laughs> Am I not supposed to curse? No, you can say where the fuck you want. Oh, okay. Yeah, we, we, we want oh, you to be as real as possible. You started stripping. I missed, I, I missed your joke. I missed your joke. Sorry, that's well, bad. Uh, bad, Brian. Bad, Brian. We'll, we'll fix it in post. <laughs> All right, Brian. Scarface. (laughs) Yeah, that's a very Scarface look right there. That is. That is very Tony Tony Montana. Uh, All right, so, Brian, the first question I always ask our guests is, how the hell did you get started in this crazy world we know as film and television? I came out here uh, July 1st, 1998. Didn't know anybody. Well, I knew one person, but he was not that helpful. Um, (laughs) I was getting him jobs uh, about six months later. Um, but my, I mean, basically long story short, I started PAing. I PAed for about a year. I loved it. I didn't get a credit, but I, I was a wardrobe PA on Castaway. Um, oh, yeah. Shit. And I became an assistant to a manager. Then I started managing as a manager. I started producing stand up specials for my clients. Then I stopped managing because it's the worst job ever. Uh, And then I started uh, just producing stand-up specials. Then I just was doing stand-up specials, documentaries, scripted, started a record label, um, started distributing, and then books, podcasts, toys, and who knows what else, but a lot of other crap that I love. And I say crap nicely. Crap. what you're saying is you're just... Demand. Yeah, that's um, awesome. Uh, so, Brian, uh, I am obsessed with two of your projects: the toys that made us and the movies that made us. As you can see, I'm in, like I'm obsessed with movies. No, so I have really? a question. <laughs> how do you? How do you? How do y'all pick? How does the team pick out what movies to do and what toys, the toy lines to do, and on all that fun stuff? I've always been curious about that. So there's a bunch of criteria that we use. Um, The first is, in my mind, I call it the uh, the Mount Rushmore test. And that basically means, is there at least one character from a toy line that if there ever was a real Mount Rushmore of toys, it could be on it and people would know. So like my wife, she don't give a shit about Transformers. (laughs) she could recognize Optimus Prime's head. Absolutely. That's the test. If it passes that test, then we do research and like there has to be a good story. Sometimes a toy comes out, it does great. And then it always does great. 
that's not that's good for the toy manufacturer. That's not great for a documentarian. <laughs> so that's number two. And then number three is we got to run it past Netflix, make sure they agree. And then we start to do the pre-interviews and we do real research. And this has only happened once. Um, I mean, out of dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of, of episodes, but sometimes you realize this is going to suck and you abort. Um, and then, um, yeah, so like I said, it's only happened once, but every other episode we found enough stuff and people, so we move forward with it. That's so awesome. Yeah, I, I'm never bored watching those shows. I love them. They're amazing. And I hope you guys keep doing them. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I just kind of pictured it was just like a, a magical hat. So you just had a bunch of names and you just drew them out. And there you go. But it's probably not. You're way better. That, um, might be, that might be more effective, but no, we don't just do that. The magician's hat. Yeah. Houdini's actual hat. Oh, um, wait, wait, wait. I left out one thing. Sorry. Yeah. The other thing, and this happens before the Mount Rushmore test, the toy or the movie, one way or another, has to still, for lack of a better expression, be in production or be alive. So yes. if you look at the toys, because oh, okay. people are always like, why don't you do Mask? And I'm like, because Mask bombed during its own lifetime. Yes. And there's nobody now that get, cares about Mask, unless people my age. So that it's the same thing. So you could be like, well, Dirty Dancing's not in production. Not true. There is a musical. A, there's 18 touring companies worldwide of Dirty Dancing. Um, they're still, I don't know how they do this. They're still putting out albums. And every yep. couple of years they say, we're making a new one. And then they don't. But for the most part, they're still making Ghostbusters, still making Die Hard, still making RoboCop. And you also want to have what I like to call like a constituency. So, for example, I love Run Lola Run, one of my favorite movies of all time. Absolutely. I, I don't bump into a lot of people on Halloween dressed like Lola. No. <laughs> so that's another variable. We need a constituency that will support the show. Awesome. That absolutely makes a lot of sense. Um, I, uh, my next question kind of goes back to your, you know, comedy producing roots. Um, I could be wrong, but do you love comedy? How'd you find that love of, of comedy growing up and use that into uh, producing so many of the greatest standups of, of the modern century? So it's funny, like movies, toys that made us, you talk to kids I've known since like I was 10. Mm -hmm. They'd be like, yeah, no shit. That's what Brian was born to do. Um, the stand-up, they still pretty surprised about it. Really? So what happened was I had been to a stand-up club once in my life for a friend of mine's birthday when I was 19, bored out of my mind. I actually walked out, which was a big deal back then because there were no cell phones. So I was mm -hmm. literally just walking around Manhattan, like waiting for my friends to get out. That's how much I didn't like it. Then... After I came out to LA, my, um, you know, I was interning for free and basically working for free for a year. I was broke, couldn't make rent. A guy I knew was quitting and he was an assistant to a comedy manager. I didn't even mm. know what a manager was, but I was broke. So I started working for him on a Monday and that Saturday, just, you know, I wanted to know he only represented comedians. Mm. So I wanted to see, you know, what that was like. I went to the Laugh Factory. I would have bet you everything I had, which wasn't much, that I would not make it through the show. Three hour first show. I stayed for the seven o'clock. I stayed for the 9.30. And I stayed for the midnight. And I, I was hooked. I was completely wow. hooked. There's a... Uh... That, that's one thing I would I've never done or thought about doing, but would be a thrill to be a stand-up comedian. I've been only been to a couple comedy shows, a couple in New York, but I that's such a exciting in, electric environment. It's just nothing like it. Listen, I don't ever want to be on stage, but other than that, it's the greatest thing in the world. 
Except yeah. for Star Wars and Star Trek. Absolutely, yes. And if you have Star Wars and Star Trek themed comedy nights, then maybe just blend the two together. Cosplay so on call the peanut butter and jelly. Absolutely, absolutely. Exactly. Um, okay, so uh, Star Trek and Star. Okay, I got a question for you uh, that you're probably not going to answer. You might. I don't know. Uh, which one do you prefer? You know, I get asked this quite a bit. Um, it, it's. I always feel like it seems like I'm dodging, but I'm not. This is like my honest answer. Star Wars. I'm in show business because of Star Wars. I, I would be a dentist, a lawyer, God forbid, maybe a banker in New York without Star Wars. And I love it. I mean, I, I love it. I went to Tunisia for my bachelor party. So like, I love it. Star Trek though, Star Trek for lack of a better expression, I'm not religious. I wasn't in the military. It gave me a code that I tried to follow my whole life. Yes. And, and again, I love it. Don't get me wrong, but it's not just a code or some weird ass thing, but it, it just gave me a set of rules to try and live by. That, <clears throat> yep, that was the right answer. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that, but that's what Star Trek does best. Yes. Um, and I hate it when people like to compare things, obviously, it's in human nature and they want to be like, well, this has got to be better than that. Why can't we just have both? Like earlier you said, peanut butter and jelly. You know, they shouldn't be at odds. They're, they're two different. They're both set in space is about the, the honest to God answer of how they're, the two of them connected. Um, so my next question, Brian, is, so you've done it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you've done, uh, uh, you know, the, a lot of, produce a lot of stand-ups. When you, when you come to a new idea, and you have to go to a dreaded pitch meeting. I know it's not my favorite thing. I know it's not anyone's favorite thing to pitch something, but um, we do have a lot of people that are watching. Do you have any tips on how to prepare for a pitch meeting or what your vibe is, what your feeling is in the moment? And the second part would be, is have you pitched something that you're like, that's definitely gonna be picked up or you're just upset that it was never seen the light of day? Uh, I hate to tell you this, I love pitching. I love mm. it. I was going to say, think, there's some people that actually do love the, the thrill I, of it. Yeah. When I, when I wake up in the morning, like I did it this morning, I woke up, looked at my schedule, little less excited about the day because I didn't have any pitches today. I love yeah. it. Love it. Um, tips. So this is what I always say. Pitching is hand grenades. It's not horseshoes. Okay. So, a lot of people try and get every little detail right before mm -hmm. the pitch. In my experience, not necessary. I think there's two things that are important. One, the executives really should have a good time. Like, imagine you have to listen to five to 10 ideas a day, knowing full well, 98% of your year, what you're hearing you don't want. Crap. I always try and have fun, get the execs laughing. And, you know, even if they don't buy it, like it should just be fun. I never want to exec seeing that I want to pitch and they dread it. So that's the first thing. Second thing, listen. Because unless they say, thank you, we'll get back to you, which is, you know, that's about 20% of the time. 80% of the time, they will ask questions. And if you're lucky, they might say something in between the questions. If that happens, you can listen and change your deck if you agree with them. Ah. And then and don't tell them you're going to do this because then they'll tell you not to. And then a day later, a week later, whatever, we send them a new deck. And then that, I'd say 70% of the time, that's how we get the sale. Oh, wow. To your Thanks. last question. Um, the worst pitch I ever had, literally as I'm walking out of the building, it was at, um, it was at AMC in New York about 15 years ago. 
I'm literally waiting for the elevator and I'm like, they will never take another pitch from me again. Like that was so bad. It was embarrassing. 20 minutes later, got a call. They were buying it. <laughs> like oh. that's, that's when I learned you, you really never know. And the other thing is for me, at least, I don't think a lot of other people are like this, but I'm not happy about this. I wish it wasn't like this, but like, we tend to sell shows like at least the second time out. Mm. Like Toys That Made Us took seven years. Like it, I pitched that. It, my agent at the time was like, dude, you gotta stop pitching this. Like it, it, you just can never give up because I, the way I psychologically view it, I always view there's this spinning wheel of like keyholes and my show is a key. So I'm trying to put my key in, but the wheel is spinning. So maybe what doesn't work that day could work another day. Ah, damn, that's, that's brilliant. That's why I never give up. Damn, that's brilliant. I love that. Ooh. I love that. Brian, what, uh, what do you think, uh, or what, what is the difference between producing a feature film and producing a stand-up special? What's the big difference there? I don't know. Let's see. I'll, I'll, here, here's how I'll answer that question. Um, the stand up specials have, uh, let's say, 37 moving parts. And a feature film has, uh, let's say, uh, 37,000. I was just about, I was just about to say when you said thirty seven. Can I work on <laughs> comedy? I mean, they're not. I mean, listen, look at our earlier work. You'll see uh, we definitely had a lot to learn. But once you learn it, it's like once uh, you buy all the equipment. Yeah. Once you have the same staff you're working with over and over for ten years. It's like riding a bike. Not, you don't forget it. And yeah. yeah it's not brain surgery that's a true. movie every time you do it is different oh yeah no so yeah and stand-up special one human heartbeat movie that's true for a weird one here and there yeah. usually a lot more than one <clears throat> and each heartbeat is connected to this crazy thing called a contract yeah. and uh yeah at uh yeah so it's a little different but maybe, yeah, it was potato and <laughs> apples. Huge difference. Wow. Um, so I'm going to jump back into the uh, comedy question again. Um, I I'm not a serious person by nature. Um, I'm a goofball. Like I'm a, I've got you know some awesome stuff like action figures and the Back to the Future inspired shirt on. But um, with what's happened and it's a trend now, I think that people have gotten a little bit too PC or maybe they can't take a joke. Is with it, with what happened on the Oscars, Will Smith coming up and smacking Chris Rock, do you see any repercussions of actual stand-up comedians um, getting some sort of backlash, maybe even physical altercations due to the fact that like the greatest movie star in the world at the most prestigious award show ever just, just got away with it? First of all, I think it's too soon to say he got away with it. Yeah, true. I, true. You know, the board met today. More and more people are coming out against them. Um, I think that's too soon. And we'll see. I mean, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I probably shouldn't say this, but there's a project that I know about that he's attached to that everybody was waiting to see if it was going to get greenlit. I know uh -huh. that project has been, or at least the decision to greenlight or not, that's been put on pause and that was yesterday. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, here's the thing. People have been getting on stage and hitting or yelling or doing other things to stand up comedians for over a hundred years. So I don't think this will cause that behavior to start. Yeah. Will it exacerbate it? If I had to guess, there will unfortunately be a bump in the short run and then it'll go back to the way it was. But um, I don't, here's the thing that's weird. Like Chris Rock is one of these comedians that because of SNL 
and his successful movie career, I don't think most of America looks at him as a stand-up. It's true. So true, true. Yeah. I know we do, but like I I don't like I think most people would see it as like an actor hitting an actor. Actor. I see. Yeah. yeah. But what do I know? Well said. Ho- hopefully not. Um, we never want that to happen. You know, violence is never the answer in any, in most circumstances. Um, but yeah, it's a sad tragedy. But this news cycle, and that's that's we're all programmed for news cycles. So, will something will happen to this? You know, a judgment will be made on everyone on the world stage, and then someone will you know fall down, shit their pants on TikTok, and that'll go viral, and that'll be the next that'll be the next thing we all talk about. Exactly. I, I don't think he will be unscathed. I, I really no. don't. Oh, no. Yeah, there'll be some kind of consequences. Brian, uh, we loved having you on. We'd love to know, uh, what do you uh, what do you got working on? What are you doing these days? You know, it's funny. You're, we're, we're talking. I'm looking around my office to see what I'm doing. Um, I hate to tell you this. Like, everything going on right now, for the most part, has not been announced. So I can't really tell you. I can tell you we have Down to Earth with Zac Efron season two in post. Yeah. We have a toy store near you season five in post. We have a bunch of docs in post. Uh, we have a doc about Margaret Lesh in post. Nice. Everything else I can't talk about yet. I hate to tell you. Yeah, you are working on like 20 some projects, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's the uh, it's the busiest we've ever been. Yeah, sure. Oh, wow. by, by awesome. a long shot. That is amazing. Well, Brian, we have had loved having you on, man. This has been amazing. Fun. Um, we really Dude. hope to have you back on in future seasons and uh, we really appreciate it, man. I would love Thanks, it. Brian. Thank you both very much. Awesome. You're very very welcome. Y'all you thank you for watching. <laughs> awesome. Oh, yeah. Thank y'all for That's watching with interviews and We'll see y'all next time. Bye, guys. Y'all, that's it. That's season two. That's a wrap. Season, season two was huge, Dustin. It was amazing. Oh, oh my gosh. People my we gosh. had. Oh, that was amazing. First thing I'm going to do is thank Noah for coming on board. Oh, my God. Like, this is welcome. This has been a dream, man. Y- y- y'all thank you for having me. Y'all don't realize Noah and our assistant, uh, they were the backbones of this show. I, you know what? I was just here. <laughs> I give credit where credit's due. I was just here. Noah and, and, and our assistant, they're the ones that are the magic behind this show. And Noah, fuck, I thank you guys so much. Oh, my God. Shout out to Sarah, Pleasure. our assistant. What's up, Sarah? What's up, Sarah? <laughs> you know, Sarah, the, cloudy the, sky the process of our show is I wake up on Monday and I have a text message from Noah or a voice chat thing. Cause I, I sleep and Noah's an early bird. I'm not. So I'll wake up Monday and I got the voice message, dude. I just booked us this person and this person for the week. And it, every week it's been amazing and a shock. Like we have got to knock things off our bucket list. I mean, we both are huge horror fans. So getting to interview uh-huh. Beatrice Bupley, Shout Mark out to Holden. Beatrice. Uh, we've become friends, so that's really cool. Um, John Crumholtz, what's up, John man? That was one of the greatest. He, he taught us how to make blood afterwards. He um, did. Thank you, Sean. That's that's right. Uh, no, I've been talking this whole time. What do you What do you got to say? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I I want to thank you. Obviously, I mean, I wouldn't be here without you having faith in me to bring me on board, and I. You know, I'm happy to be here and I wouldn't be here. Dustin wouldn't be here and you wouldn't even be listening and watching if you guys weren't here to support us. And I want to thank you. Right. Yeah. There you all of you, you and you and certainly not you, but everyone else. Thank you so much for going on with this journey. We've got a season three that's going to come up here soon and it's going to be themed. That's going to be our bread and butter moving forward. What's the theme, Dustin? Uh, well, there's a couple themes now, uh, we'll tease. So we're hoping to have like three or four themes in season three, season three is gonna be a little different. It's not going to just be like, just, you know, we're picking and pulling random producers, directors, and actors. We're going to do a nineties theme. So we're going to pull people from the nineties. 
We're going to do a director theme one week. So we're going to pull directors. It, it's TV shows. We're going to pull people from a TV show. It's going to be amazing, y'all. And then everyone that's done, naked body doubles. That's going to end, end it a season of nothing but the body double, butt doubles, titty doubles. That's news doubles. to me. <laughs> oh, we didn't talk about that? We didn't talk about that? <laughs> not to, that was not a no pitch meeting. <laughs> oh, wow. Pitch meetings, dreams, whatever. Uh, potatoes, potatoes. Um, but you'll be seeing this face and that face on a brand new TV show on YouTube before you'll see another episode of Hollywood Interviews. Yes, so we might as well announce it now. The next project that we are working on, we've been working on, is the Noah and Dustin show. It's going to be an amazing project. I wouldn't say it was a TV show, which maybe one day a studio or a network will pick it up. It'll be a web show, but it's going to be different in the fact that we're going to be doing skits every episode, but every skit isn't going to be comedy. It's not just going to be horror. We're going to be doing all the genres. So we could have a horror skit and then the next gets a drama skit. So it's going to be amazing. And we'll have musical guests on. So that's pretty awesome. And we'll be doing other things here and there. So tune in for the Owen Dustin show, which should be premiering in April, which are we in April now? We're okay. not, not yet. This not quite is, yet. Not yet. Uh, and then season three of Hollywood interviews should be back sometime in the summer. So yeah. Y'all seriously. Thank you. Guys. And if I'm watching, if I'm watching us on this TV, it's a TV show. I'm just saying. <laughs> you're not wrong. Okay, you're not wrong. <laughs> We're making a TV show. You're not wrong. Uh, I love you guys. Make sure you like, subscribe, hit that, you know, notification bell. It helps us uh, and helps you get all the greatest content as soon as it goes live on YouTube. And we want you as part of the conversation. So we always welcome comments, suggestions, recipes, Dear John letters, whatever you want to put down in the comments below, even if it's your grocery list to help you remember what kind of bread you want to buy at Whole Foods, put it in the comments. We would love to see it. Yes. And if you guys and girls out there want to have someone seen on the show, definitely let us know and we'll try to hook that up. Or if you're that someone, let us know. We'd love to have you. Want to be on the show, let us know. All right, y'all. Thank you so much, though, in all seriousness, for watching season two of Hollywood interviews. Yeah.